This is Dr. Veronique Helenon, who is a historian uh, whose area of expertise is in the African diaspora with an emphasis on French-speaking dimensions in the Caribbean. Uh, she's a Fulbright alumna, alumna uh, currently a faculty member in history at Roxbury Community College in Boston, and has published articles and book chapters on the African diaspora, colonialism, French hip hop, and is also the author of French Caribbeans in Africa, Di Diaspora Connections and Colonial Administration, 1880 to 1939. Um, her talk today will be examining African genocides in the time of Palestine. So let's all uh, welcome Dr. Veronique Helenon. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the youth. Thank you for all of you for being here. Okay, so um, I'm going to um, explain the title, go over a few uh, definitions. So first of all, I'm uh, thanks, uh, thankful to uh, my predecessors who already put uh, a little bit of, uh, explain a little bit of what I, I want to uh, uh, go over. So uh, genocide. What's a genocide? So we have a definition, and the definition, as um, John von Benjamin just explained, uh, was a term coined by uh, Raphael Lemkin in 1944, and that's the term that is uh, used um, uh, that uh, to uh, by the uh, UN General Assembly in 46. It was also codified in 1948. Um, by uh, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, ratified by uh, 153 countries. So that's the term that was uh, really specifically designed to talk about the crime committed by Nazi Germany. And um, as uh, uh, Dr. Fubenjian explained, this term, you know, has been sometimes uh, discussed, debated, because uh, it's been seen by some maybe as narrow. But still, it's, I think it's a useful frame to uh, talk, obviously, about genocide. Uh, I've tried to, uh, since uh, we, because of, of what, of the current uh, actuality in, uh, in the Middle East, try to see maybe there's uh, some aspects of what is happening in Palestine that can help us uh, think about what um, could be a genocide and what we could, um, how we could um, do uh, in face of a genocide. Since it's such a massive event that we tend to feel extremely powerless in the face of uh, the horrors happening uh, in, uh, in, in such cases. So I took Palestine and I took uh, in Africa, uh, the example that I want to focus on uh, is the uh, Rwandan um, uh, example. Uh, so as we know, the ICJ uh, determined that there are plausible causes that the acts committed in uh, Palestine amount to a uh, genocide, so that's the frame that I chose. And in Africa, uh, as uh, John also mentioned, uh, also the term was not coined, there are many examples, but still it is with G the Rwanda example that that uh, term was specifically uh, applied. Um, so what do I call the time of Palestine? So first of all, even if we uh, look at a, uh, a genocide as happening at a certain a specific uh, time, uh, in terms of Rwanda, for instance, is the 100 days um, between April and June of 1994. However, I would argue that a, a genocide happened in a long time. Uh, uh, in the long term. They're very uh, uh, roots that are uh, very deep. And to really understand a genocide, we have to go uh, beyond that. So that's one aspect. Uh, another aspect is that because of this long time period that you know uh, goes beyond the specific uh, timeline of what we usually, in which we usually frame the genocide, then it becomes oftentimes complicated to uh, 
detangle the bundle of responsibilities and implications. Uh, oftentimes, perpetrators are not um, necessarily brought to justice. So that's uh, another, another point. Uh, thirdly, uh, genocide also do not uh, take place in a vacuum. The international community, so that was, uh, we saw previously with, with the uh, previous two interventions that um, in these cases, um, the international community be being the Western powers uh, colonizing in Africa. So the international community lives off of a genocide. There's no genocide happening without, you know, um, uh, reason. Um, there are ideological reasons, but there are also uh, very materialistic reasons. Um, um, and I would lastly make the argument that, you know, um, what could we do? Because it feels so helpless. Um, I believe that uh, international solidarity is the solution. International solidarity uh, has a place to uh, play, and an important one. Although we tend to live and to believe that all solutions have to come from top down, from uh, states, governments, international institutions, uh, people can um, uh, uh, play very important play, uh, parts and take uh, important actions. So let's try to apply these uh, to the Rwanda. So, to the Rwanda situation. So first, some of key facts, so I'm not going to go over uh, too much because we already uh, heard, and it's always, that's you know, what I was uh, sharing earlier, always so much better to hear it from a person because we tend to talk about genocides because of the scope of what is happening uh, as if it's, uh, we talk about numbers, right? And it becomes a little bit abstract, as if, almost as if we're doing math. So it's always good to have a real human being who can really share an experience. But, um, you know, uh, as it, it was said, uh, uh, out of an original population of about seven millions, uh, we had one million about, so the number and it's always, you know, um, not surprising, but the number have been a little bit disputed, but uh, that's the, at least the, the number that uh, uh, Rwanda um, recognized, one million people uh, were massacred in 100 days. Like, I think these numbers are important just for us to pose, to understand the magnitude of what happened in such a short, short time. That means that in terms of what people had to see on just walking by, to smell, to hear. Uh, I remember at that time I was uh, in France and even if it was not really well covered by the media, but I, I clearly remember uh, on TV there were images that with absolutely no comments, which was even more horrifying. So, uh, and you would see blood in the river and then maybe a limb and, and, and that for an hour. So that was the type of, you know, of uh, images that uh, we received also. So uh, we have to, you know, really think about what that meant for people who went through this. Um, and according to author Philip Gorevich, the death rate during this time was actually three times the rate of the Holocaust, right? Because of it's so, so condensed and so intense and we have one million people. Um, um, so we spoke about uh, genocide, we speak about uh, massacres, uh, mutilations, also rapes, it's about uh, a half million women that were raped during this 100 uh, days uh, uh, period. So that's the short, you know, when we speak about the Rwandan genocide, uh, that's the timeline that we're looking at. But as I said earlier, uh, the long period is important because there are roots to this. So they've been, you know, um, I'm, I'm just going to be brief since we uh, already heard uh, about this uh, previously. Um, so there, there, there are different um, 
what we call the ethnic groups. So that's just the word ethne is also a word that is extremely loaded and can be extremely prob problematic. That comes from a Western vision. So the three groups that we have in uh, Rwanda are the Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa. The uh, Hutu, that's the overwhelming majority, 84%. The Tutsi, 15%. And the Twa, who are um, also sometimes called pygmy, one, about 1%. One so that's really a minority. But yet, they were also uh, um, heavily impacted by the genocide. So that's where we see that uh, the definition that was given earlier it's, it's interesting to have a frame to talk about these things, and at the same time, it does not always fit. Just like during the Holocaust, we all also know that there were other groups that were also targeted, even if uh, Jews were by, by, uh, by far the uh, largest group that the Nazis were uh, massacring. Uh, so before colonization, we didn't really have any ethnic wars be, uh, among these different groups. It's really um, with the um, uh, colonization first of the German, uh, by the German by the uh, late 19th century, uh, then when the German were defeated during World War uh, I, uh, Rwanda became a Belgian colony. So that's when uh, we start seeing how the uh, colonizers are using uh, what they believe to see as physical differences, and we saw has how they are uh, creating that. Uh, we have to keep in mind that this is not something that was specifically done to people in, in Rwanda. That was a mindset, what we call scientific racism, where for uh, the, uh, several centuries, people ha around the globe that did not look like um, Western Europeans were measured, classified, and categorized. Uh, and in the 1930s, uh, is the Belgian government introduced a permanent ID with ethnic class, uh, classifications. And that will be uh, extremely uh, lethal in 1994. Um, so the Belgians are going to play different cards, first favoring the Tutsi. Uh, we saw the role of the Christian missionary. And at some point, they're also turning uh, towards the Hutu. Uh, after initially uh, favoring the Tutsi, they also conceived that the underprivileged uh, are the Hutu. They're the largest minority. Uh, they're, they're the largest group. And uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Belgian mind, they're the largest groups uh, against this tiny elite of Tutsi. So churches, the church is making effort to educate uh, Hutu and to include larger numbers of them in the clergy. In the uh, early uh, 1960s, the Belgians uh, replaced most Tutsi chiefs by Hutu ones, and there's um, what we, we saw the uh, Hutu social revolution. Uh, um, so that's uh, a movement that is coming fr also from Hutu people, um, uh, writing about them as being uh, different and uh, having uh, special um, uh, characteristics. Um, then when the... All, the, the uh, what the Belgian are going, the Belgians are going to do also is that they're going to uh, um, get rid of the king who was a Tutsi, and in the name of democracy. So who doesn't like democracy, right? It seems a great idea, except that. If you already played that game of pitting one group against another, one group being 84% of the population, the other group being 14%, per, who's going to win the elections all the time, right? So that's a great democracy. So that's the democracy, that, that's, well, that's democratic, you know, that's how the democratic game is go. And in fact, that led to a hoodoo led democracy. Uh, so when the, democ the, the country became independent, uh, Hutu further imposed their dominance, and Tutsi, different Tutsi groups left for uh, uh, neighboring countries such as Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania, Zaire at the time, which became uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And from there, they're, they're always, they're, the aim was always to come back to Rwanda and try to uh, 
regain power. So from there, they reorganized different armed groups and started, uh, uh, well, organizing and leading to, uh, uh, we already saw the chronology, but to uh, the uh, first, there's the, uh, um, the airplane that is uh, shot with the two presidents being killed, two Utus, and that's the starting point uh, for everything. Um, well, a, a few things that, that, I, that uh, well, the international community also, be, which I mentioned as a second point earlier, uh, the international community also plays obviously a, 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 an important role. We could just look at a genocide and say, oh, well, we have these two groups, you know, uh, but, um, uh, fighting against each other, and it's just in that little bubble. Uh, in fact, this is never the case. There's always multiple forces uh, at play, and it's really important to consider them, and uh, as I said earlier, to detangle, you know, who's doing what, uh, that can take some time. Um, so, in when the genocide took place, the specific events of the one in red days, uh, you have a number of forces uh, in, uh, in Rwanda. You have the, um, the US uh, that are supporting uh, the RPF. So the RPF, that's the forces coming from the neighboring country trying to get back to, uh, uh, to uh, Rwanda, which they will do. Uh, and you have the French supporting uh, the, uh, the government there. Uh, you have the UN also. Um, all these different groups uh, were not ready to do anything for what was happening exactly at that time, which was obviously urgent matter. Um, in that really little time, people were obviously being decimated at a rapid and uh, violent, uh, and violently, vi uh, rapidly and violently. Uh, for instance, just to give you an idea, um, there were checkpoints uh, at different, so in town, for, uh, and people uh, would have to show their ID. And if your ID said you Tutsi, that's 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 uh, that's not that's not that's probably the end of your life. Uh, so the French, for instance, they launched the operation uh, turquoise, and which was that operation to really repatriate their people, French people. But that came to the point. Applying that rule came to the point that they could uh, separate uh, French people who were married to um, Tutsi. Um, uh, um, uh, citizens, um, uh, Rwandan citizens. Uh, so families were separated. They would even go as far as drop people who were uh, Tutsi at the checkpoint, knowing perfectly what would happen to them. All right, so again, it's really important because wha what we receive from the media, which is also part of uh, the international community, community uh, that's the, let's say, the, the, the facade of the international community, since there's a lot of um, things be happening underground. What we receive from the media usually does not tell us that story, right? We don't have necessarily the image of the French um, acting in, in that manner. Uh, the UN, um, uh, Romeo Delaria, that was, who was mentioned before, who was there uh, uh, earlier, even before, so that, that mission had been in place before the, the genocide had started, and he had received information that something was coming up. He knew that of specific places where there were weapons, and he wanted to act. He received the order from the UN not to do anything. So again, we see one you know, block after another. And it's really, again, very important for us to have all this full picture because the images that I described, for instance, that I received at the time uh, from a French TV screen with no, no explanation whatsoever, that just feed the overall um, image of the barbaric Africans who are just killing each other. And there's no narrative about really what is happening and why. Um, <clears throat> um, so 
the international committee community sorry uh, it's um, it's extremely important to keep in mind all these different actors because they're actively um, uh, um, uh, working towards what is the goal. They are, uh, unfortunately, benefits from a genocide. A genocide does not happen just because people don't like each other. As we saw, there are you know, ways to shape people's mind um, in the, the case of, the, of Rwanda, for th at least three years, people had been fed by a specific uh, media, but that was not the only one, but the um, uh, uh, radio television uh, Mil Colline, that uh, the Tutsi were uh, people to be killed that in fact they were not even really uh, human beings. So what are the benefits? You know, obviously, if you feel you feed, you know, any form of, of, uh, of war, you're going to be able to send weapons. Uh, so weapons coming from the UK, from France, uh, but also China in the case of Rwanda. Um, um, one of the, uh, the tools, weapons that was used to kill people was the machete. Some of them had been um, ordered because, you know, it was organized uh, months ahead so that there would be enough of the machetes to kill that many people in such, a, such little time. Um, on the economic level also, there are benefits to RIP. Um, and if we look now, that's where it is important to really open a little bit the lens, because again, uh, we're looking at, I said, a certain time, uh, the 100 days in the terms of, of Rwanda, well, we need to look a little bit you know, deeper to add a longer timeline to better understand the roots. Uh, also, uh, who are the actors? Utu, Tutsi? No, not so much. There are more people. Uh, and then in terms of the economic factors, um, what is happening? Who is benefiting from what? And that's where also it's important to now look not just at Rwanda, but at the region. Specifically, uh, let's look at the Congo. Um, so what happened is that as the RPF you know, got into Rwanda, there's obviously people are being killed, you know, there's people are fighting, a number of people are trying to escape. And where are they going to escape? They're trying to uh, go to the neighboring countries. One of those countries where they're going is the Congo. Uh, so you have the region of the Kivu, that's Eastern Congo. It's really close to, it's close by uh, Rwanda. And that's where you have a lot of people going. Uh, two million people living in tents for the longest time. Um, and that now um, creates an opportunity for also the Rwanda, uh, for the 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 for Rwanda to send an army because a lot of these people are Hutu, and now you have um, a border that is totally porous, uh, with um, a possibility to take um, to get access to a number of resources. So. Um, in the previous uh, presentation, it was meant the, the Congo was mentioned. One reason why uh, King Leopold, um, you know, uh, um, we saw all the mutilations. One reason that King Leopold was so interested in that region, and that, that since the uh, the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1888, it's because already at the time the resources. So at the time, there are obviously some of the resources that nobody had any idea about, but rubber, for instance, was something that was important, for instance, to uh, the car industry in, in the Western world. Um, now, uh, we're jumping to uh, the 20th century. What is interesting in the Congo? A lot of things. Actually, all of us right now, today, we are using resources right, that are uh, objects uh, that, uh, that we can use only because of these resources. Um, so coltan being, you know, uh, a specific mineral, 
um, that is used for microprocessors. So you have uh, Coltan that is used to make your the chips for your phones, uh, your um, uh, your computers, for instance. Um, if we're using uh, electric cars, cobalt. So, and uh, frankly, the the Congo is a huge country, the um, the DRC, and it's uh, the the Democratic Republic of the Congo because we have also the French Congo, which is uh, a, a different country, and uh, the resources are abundant, and it's been plundered since since Western Europeans have been able to put their hand on, on the Congo. Um, so interestingly, in terms of coltan, that is so important, uh, Rwanda has become the first producer. However, according to the Pulitzer Center, uh, so, so sorry, according to the Pulitzer Center in 2018 and 2019, the average price were um, about 23, uh, a, a little bit less than $24 a kilo in DR and $36 um, uh, dollars in Rwanda. However, according to e um, ECOFIN, the Economic and Financial Affairs Council of the European Union, 90% of the coltan exported from Rwanda, in fact, comes from fraudulent imports from neighboring Congo. So um, what, what is happening is that um, interventions against the uh, Hutu that took refuge to the Congo was also a uh, way to get access to some of the, um, the resources of the Congo. Um, so, um, the former director of the UN Disarmament, Demobilization and Reintegration Services, Celeste uh, Bamwisho Buira uh, Bivuya, says that Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, is not built with the wealth of Rwanda, it is the resources of the DRC. And recently, Rwanda opened the first coltan processing factory of the African continent, although the resources are not really coming from Rwanda. Um, so, so this, again, to show some of the limits of the current definition of genocide, which you know, have already been um, uh, uh, debated. There are different ways to think about how to balance situation, the, uh, uh, such situations in a way that uh, would put a halt to the exploitation of the resources of some countries to the benefit of others. Um, so what could be some of those solutions? Uh, I would say local determination. Uh, it's, uh, it's important that people you know, are empowered locally and also international sol solidarity. Uh, there's a really a necessity to restore humanity because beyond you know all definition, after all, uh, uh, what is a genocide? That's a deep, profound attack on humanity. What is a human being? That means that all human beings must be concerned. Um, so, um, very limited again results from the international from international justice in Rwanda, for instance, the International Crime Tribunal for Rwanda, which was um, uh, established between 1994 and 2015, convicted 93 persons. So, obviously, there's very, there's a lot of limits to what the inter what international justice can do at least has been done has done uh, until now uh, so um, restoring humanity what could that mean that means i believe a lot of things um, li very little things for instance just naming victims that that is really extremely important and that's what i think that uh, we it, it was um, uh, a profound opportunity, uh, you know, uh, chance that we could have, you know, uh, a testimony of, of, of a survivor today. Uh, there's a museum in Kigali where uh, uh, people who've been victim are uh, portrayed with their pictures, their names. Uh, that's really one of the first things that would happen in a genocide is to dehumanize people. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to strip them for their humanity, from their humanity. Usually when we hear about a genocide, 
we don't hear about people's names. We hear Hutu, Tutsis. And then beyond that, who are these people? Do they have any names, right? So I just wanted to share, you know, just at least you would hear three names. Not all of them are from Rwanda, but uh, so Bertrand Calumé Bouleri, who had to pay for his wife not to be killed by machetes and knives, but by bullets. So he had to pay the, uh, uh, when they came for his wife, and, and he was in, in his home with his child, with his children. So for her not to, you know, to go through this, he paid. Um, you may know him from, uh, the, uh, from the movie, uh, so Paul Rousseza Bagina, who's the Hutu manager of Hotel des Mille Collines, who was hiding and helped hundreds of Tutsi. Uh, Mbai Ndiaye, who was a Senegalese Unimar, so Unimar was the uh, UN mission at the time, so he's a Unimar soldier who died during the genocide, also helping others. Um, Marie-Louise Nyobu Hunjiro, who was raped five times a day over five days. But interestingly, it's even harder to find names for people who are right now today because this war which started in 1996 in the Congo, uh, in the Kivu uh, eastern part of the Congo, which is still ongoing, it's really even more difficult. So you will find a lot of documentaries, a lot of um, articles, and usually you will get words, vague terms such as a minor, a worker, children, women, men, artisanal workers, right? So um, I would say that, you know, these crimes, these genocides, although they seem to happen far away and we hear about them once in a while when we turn on the radio, uh, we listen to, uh, to, we watch TV or we open a newspaper within, or we open a book maybe, they're really part of our lives, right? Uh, it is our responsibility as human beings to do something. Um, first of all, we're talking about human beings. We're talking about people's safety, people's health, people's hygiene, people's mental health, people's happiness. We tend to hear, to forget that. All, everybody, you know, should have a right just to be happy. Uh, but it's, it looks like, you know, it's the norm from, for some people not to be, um, to have access to that. Uh, but also, genocides create, lead to environmental disasters. Um, if you look at the, uh, the mines where coltan is dig from, you can tell that there's nothing can, can grow there anymore. And these are, this is really a huge tract of lands where nothing will grow. Uh, people digging tunnels of seven meters down to try to get some coltan and get whatever price that the, uh, the person who's going to, be, to buy it from them decide that they should give. These are never the people who make the money. The, those who make the money are the ones who are going to uh, some of the intermediaries, the intermediaries, and, and for sure, uh, those who are on the, in, the international, who have access to the international mar market. Um, again, we have a responsibility because uh, genocide, and in this specific case of the Rwanda, with this larger. Uh, configuration that includes the Congo, we are using objects that are created only because people are being exploited and are dying. If you want to look at a comparison, also uh, there, again, with all historical comparisons, there are always uh, difficulties and problems, but you could think about what happened in Great Britain, in France, in the United States, in the uh, 18th, 19th century, where people had to finally realize, oh my God, I'm eating sugar every day. Oh, where does that come from? Uh, at least maybe in the United States, you know, that sense was a little bit, you know, closer because it was on the same territory. But for people in France or in Great Britain, it felt like far away. It's somewhere across the Atlantic, you know, 
you know, no big deal, you know. Oh, well, I heard about, yeah, people being enslaved in the Caribbean. Is that really as bad as being, you know, a peasant in Europe? I don't know. So it took a campaign and it took awareness. Uh, one way to bring awareness is um, social media. Social media are important. Um, it depends, you know, it's like any tool, you know, it depends how you use it just like the machete uh, during the 100 day. Machete can be great to open a coconut if you're thirsty. Um, and so it, it just depends how you use it. Um, with the uh, current event in Palestine, it was interesting. it's interesting also to see that a number of people on social media have been also trying to use that platform to uh, promote you know, uh, awareness about what is happening currently in the Congo. Uh, so that's really an ongoing effort, but uh, everybody has to be aware that in a way we are complicit. And uh, just like the sugar that people were using for their tea, for their little scones, for tea time, for the, for the little jam that they would use, etc. You know, this was tainted with human blood. Um, right, so, you know, the, again, the genocide may, be, uh, may take some place far away, but it does affect all of us as we also benefit from it, even if we don't want to pay attention to it, right? So, in, in, a, in, in a way, and that's why, uh, what also I meant by restoring humanity, it's also impacting us as human to be using objects that are constantly built on the suffering of others. So uh, it's our responsibility to reclaim our humanity by deciding what type of world we want for us and for those who are also victims of genocides. Thank you. <laughs>